Hi. Um, so when doing injections on the knee, um, is there a reason why you would want to use an ultrasound as opposed to just uh, kind of going palpation guided? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the reason is for increased accuracy. So when you're doing a blind uh, approach or a palpation guided approach, it's about 70% accurate, um, if I'm rem remembering the research correctly, whereas with ultrasound or fluoroscopy, you're anywhere from 95, 96, upwards of 100%. Um, and part of the reason for that is on the anterior aspect of the knee, when you're doing that, um, you know, the medial or the lateral eye approach, you can be in the fat pad and not in the synovial membrane yet. And when you push, because fat is loose areolar tissue, it is like, it's gonna feel like you're in the joint. And so you might go, oh yeah, I'm in the joint, when in reality you're in the fat pad. And so <clears throat> because of that, you know, the, uh, the accuracy isn't as high as it could be. And so my, uh, my kind of standards that I've set for myself is that, if I'm ever doing anything intra-articular, I'm using image guidance. And whether that's 5%, pro-low, whether that's PRP or stem cell, I'm using uh, imaging. <clears throat> um, and then anything PRP level and higher, I'm using imaging as well. And it's, now, there are certain uh, instances, and, and this is a lot of what I do when we start getting into like treating ligaments and broad tendon and theses, is that um, I'm using the ultrasound to locate, okay, here is the region of where the MCL is attaching, and then I'm going to use the ultrasound to guide my peppering. Because what you have to be careful of, and you'll see this if you ever go out and you ever shadow other docs who weren't trained in palpation-based prolo, they were just trained in, you know, doing intra-articular injections and things like that, is they'll find the one slice of the MCL, and then they'll do like two injections and then they're done. And that doesn't cover the whole breadth of the actual attachment. So it's, you have to be careful to not rely too much on the imaging and just say, oh, well, I saw the MCL in one slice and I treated two spots. And so um, it's not that I'm using the imaging just to get those few spots. I'm using it to kind of locate, okay, here's the area for them that MCL is attaching. And so now I'm going to go through and I'm going to use my ultrasound to guide my, my peppering of the area. Um, and so with PRP and higher, the reason I do that is just because patients are paying significantly more money. And um, one, it's really good to be able to show them, okay, here's what we're going to be injecting and that kind of stuff. That helps them feel a little more comfortable and confident with your treatment. Um, frankly, it probably increases the placebo effect of the treatment, which hey, if we can add in imaging and that improves their outcome just because of placebo effect, I'm cool with that. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's kind of my, my standards that I set. Did that answer your question? Yep. <clears throat> do you even consider prolotherapy for OA anymore? Or do you just jump? Yeah, yeah. no, I do. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, one of the big things for me in my practice is uh, whether patients in or out of state. Because most of my injection patients right now are coming from out of state. And so if, <clears throat> if we have prolo and PRP, and I predict it might be four prolo treatments, but two PRP treatments, and it costs them 1500 bucks for flight and accommodation, I'd rather save them 3000 on travel for them to spend an extra 1000 on the treatment so that way they actually save $2,000 if my projections and, and my hypotheticals are, are correct. So um, so because of that, I end up doing a lot more PRP than I do prolo. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the times, if, if someone's in state, I'll generally start with a prolo unless they really are wanting to do PRP just to make sure we're in the right location, we're getting a positive response, uh, that type of stuff, um, and then moving forward from that. So if you had a patient <clears throat> in state with uh, pro, with a, a like an OA, maybe a, like a type two or something like or something not that severe yet. Start with, with grade two. Grade two, yes. Yeah. Um, and it's not that severe yet. Um, 
but you want it just to see if the treatment would help <clears throat> use PR, use a prolo first and then maybe move on to PRP after yeah. that. Yeah. Do you ever think that um, like a PRP one and done would be more beneficial than like a series of prolos or do you just want to gauge to see if they're getting better first with the prolo? Um, I mean, sometimes it's gauging, yeah. sometimes it's just going straight for it. So the other thing too is, uh, is the financial constraint. So if someone says, you know, I only have a thousand bucks, you know, to be able to do this, you know, every four to six weeks, then, then that might put them into the, okay, let's just do prolo and we might need to, because remember, even if they plateau, they could hang out at that plateau for a month or two while they save up more money. Mm -hmm. Generally, most people are not going to regress majorly during that time. And so you could space treatments out every three months, even though they might need it every six weeks. Um, and so uh, so that's probably one of the, uh, the reasons. And I, I think most of the time, the decision for Pro vs. PRP is, is usually a financial. I still have not yet uh, found a um, like a really strong. Oh, I think that you need to have Prolo over PRP because of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. thing that's occurring. Usually, it's actually the reverse, right? Where if they have uh, fat pad impingement or they have um, you know some bone marrow edema and things like that generally the biologics are going to do right. better than five or 25 percent dextrose and then uh, how would you compare the one what's the comparison in cost between prolo and PRP generally and then in addition what how many treatments of prolo do you think is uh, the same efficacy as one of PRP uh, for NeoA, I'd probably say a PRP treatment is uh, one and a half to two times the strength of Prolo, uh, uh -huh. depending. And then uh, the price jump is usually uh, anywhere between 300 to 500 bucks increase. So about a 50% uh, increase. So, so similar efficacy to price comparison, about two times. In each no well not no no so it, it'd be so the price would go up by about 30 to 50 percent yeah but the efficacy could go up by generally and it's on the higher end of twofold yeah so you're getting a doubling and so when when I compare cost effectiveness with like the um, the outcomes mm -hmm. generally it's it's smarter economically to do PRP Okay. <clears throat> Just the way I have it structured and set up. And regarding the efficacy of the Prolo solution, I know we've talked about like the percentage and how there haven't been any comparative studies, 25 right. versus 50%. Do you feel like, are, are, there, are there safety reasons as to why we don't go higher percentage in, um, in joints? And if not, do you feel like it could be more efficacious if, we, if you did a higher percentage dextrose? <clears throat> so... That's a good question. I don't know. And now, <clears throat> the, the, the question is really how do we balance the, um, the hyperosmotic effect that we're you know, putting into that knee joint because we're changing the osmolarity. So the, the, the chondrocytes and the cells of the meniscus and all that type of stuff are being exposed to a really high osmolarity content, which is going to pull water from them, which can cause some apoptosis, and is part of this cascade of healing and, and initiating that. And so, what's the tipping point on too much versus not enough? I, I don't know, and my <clears throat> my guess is that it's patient dependent, and it's also um, uh, the severity of the condition dependent and the location you're doing the injection dependent. And I just don't think we're anywhere near understanding, you know, uh, what, where that actually comes from. So generally what I say is, look, we have a really good study. That's the Topol study that I refer to all the time. It's from 2017, I think, or 2018. Oh, that like they show 25% dextrose in a series of injections in a small subset of patients, uh, or they had a small cohort, but 
they had positive improvements with the majority of them having actual highland cartilage regrowth. And so to me, 30% may be better, but it's an unknown that I'd rather say, I know that in the research, 25% has shown this. So unless there's other basic science research saying that, oh, actually, because of this, 30% or 35% might actually be better, even though we don't have the clinical data on that yet. I haven't seen anything in the basic science to suggest that, to make me truly go higher than, than the 25%. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. So it's still room for a lot of learning and, and improvement in oh, therapies. Yeah. yeah. Even with something that's been around for a while, like prolotherapy. Yeah. 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 That's, that's neat. Yeah. What are your thoughts on reducing the amount of anesthetic used and adding saline instead? That's, so that's generally what I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, right now my ratio is, so I use ropivacaine and I do um, about one tenth of the solution as ropivacaine. So if, I have a, if I'm making 10 cc's of Prolo, I add in one cc of ropivacaine my dextrose, my tromiel, and then the rest of it is uh, normal saline. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's based off, um, I'm pretty sure this was the Centeno study, or a study that he was involved with, looking at um, actually stem cell function in relation to different concentrations of different local anesthetics. And ropivacaine at a, um, a 12 and a half percent solution uh, didn't really impact stem cell function, whereas even like lidocaine or even marcaine at that concentration affected it. Um, and so I'm basing my numbers off of, okay, well, I want to provide some patient comfort, but I want to reduce the potential negative impact on stem cells. So that way the patient gets a, you know, as much of the theoretical potential healing as opposed to a little bit less because we're impairing stem cell function. How do you spell topo? T O P O L. So you're saying it, you're using a 10% right, relative dextro, I mean, um, anesthetic solution? Yeah, yeah, so just under that 12 and a half. In regards to lidocaine, what? Do we know the percentage of lidocaine they used for, for that study showing the chondrotoxicity? Uh, for the stem cell one, I can pull it up more back in the room. But it, lidocaine was uh, better, so not as harmful as marcaine, but it was more harmful than ropivacaine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, we might have discussed this in the past. Have you done any uh, prolo for Elos Danios or perineuro for fibro? Yes and yes, and both positive. <clears throat> um, Elos Danios is, uh, is obviously tricky because you're fighting an uphill battle, right, against the genetic component, but uh, we do see positive benefits. The, the really, really tricky part is it's so widespread and throughout the whole body and for, and those patients tend to flare more than the average patient does and I don't know if that's because of the disease or or what the particular reason is but the trend that I've seen in talking with other docs is that they flare more and so when I have a patient with EDS my approach is we're generally not going to treat more than two three areas max and that's just depending on like you know if it's like if we are including like all of the low back and SI, like that's all we'll do. If it's like uh, both ankles and a shoulder, then I'm okay with that because the ankles are smaller uh, joints than doing you know a whole bunch of levels in the spine. Um, and then we just slowly chip away at it because it's you have to. They're going to need multiple treatments, and you're going to have to partition out. So I generally just ask them what's your top, your worst two to three areas pain wise and instability wise and we start there mm -hmm. and then we focus or continue to improve. Um, <clears throat> with fibro, so uh, perineural can work really really well for fibro but it's still a uh, it's still a band-aid treatment yeah. because you've got a systemic uh, thing going on and um, 
And I'm a, a big believer in that uh, a large majority of patients with fibro have some past trauma that they uh, haven't, pro their body has not properly dealt with. And so I think that's a huge component to their healing is figuring out that, you know, past trauma and, and resolving it or working through it and that type of stuff. So, but in an in interim, the perineural injections can be really, really beneficial. Same with, and I'm actually starting now to do more nerve hydrodissections than perineural. Because if I, for example, if we have, you know, pain that is basically the whole lower extremity, the whole upper extremity, if we come upstream and we can nerve hydrodissect saphenous, and we can come and do common peroneal, and we can do sural, then we can do kind of uh, one location that can affect a whole area as opposed to doing, right. you know, 30 to 40 pokes in an area when patients are already hypersensitive to that. Anything else? You talked about um, <clears throat> using peptides last Friday. Yeah. Awesome. Did you like the talk? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. Like the food too. Well, <laughs> I'll say. Um, do you feel like at this point, any of those peptides, I wanted to ask afterward, but I had to go to shift. Any of those peptides are, are worth replacing the Prola or the PRP currently? Or do we still need to get more research on those peptides? Um, so I think we need more research to really be able to say that in particular BPC seems to be working really, really well, but again, I don't know how it compares, truly how it compares to, uh, you know, a side by side comparison with prolotherapy or even PRP. Um, there, the, um, the PPS, the pentacin polysulfate sodium works, can work really well in particular. The AOD 9604 with hyaluronic acid can work well uh, in particular. Um, I'm trying to remember, I don't think there has been a study that compares that to just straight hyaluronic acid. I'd want to see that. Um, and then there was one more that I was going to say for in particular. But so I, I think. I definitely think there's going to be a, right now there's a huge boom in um, systemic use of peptides, right, oral capsules, subcutaneous injectables. I have a feeling, especially with November coming in the whole FDA stuff with stem cells, is that docs may sh start shifting to trying and figuring out combinations of peptides, whether that's a combo of oral, systemic, and injectable, to kind of uh, try to be able to mimic what a, you know, an autologous stem cell procedure is doing. And I think it's, it's potentially possible. It may, uh, and it'll probably be just near as expensive as doing a stem cell procedure, but it might avoid the whole, all the FDA stuff. So I think there's going to be a big boom in injection use of peptides over the next year or two years. That I think will be cool, but I'm look, I'm looking forward to seeing studies, and there are ongoing studies, especially through TaylorMade. They're getting their docs to do, you know, some smaller, you know, intra practice studies and things like that. There we go. It's good yeah. To yeah. yeah. So our main uh, landmarks for our knee. Okay. Obviously, we're gonna have our knee cap. The tickle. Yeah. I'm like super technical. <laughs> Place your hand right here. Don't tickle anymore? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. You move your hand then if it didn't work. Do you guys know that trick? Yeah. You yeah, have them. Have them put their hand because their brain thinks it's them. They're guarding too. Yeah. Tell our ligament down onto our tibial tuberosity. So these are the basic landmarks, okay, that you're going to use, and you can palpate the distal end of kind of tibial tuberosity. Can you guys see well enough? Remove if you can't. <clears throat>
fruit. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're scanning the knee joint. The first thing you want to find if you're going to go intraarticular, so we go intraarticular from a, uh, a superior approach, okay? We, and the reason why is because you can't actually see the intraarticular space from when you go through the eyes of the knee, okay? You can see cartilage there, but you can't actually see the intraarticular space. So you can't technically confirm that you're in intraarticular space, whereas from the suprapatellar recess, you can, okay? So first thing you're going to want to find is patella, okay? So here we have patella, so this makes our quadriceps tendon, okay? You can scan through, and you can see here's the medial aspect of it, okay? There's the most medial fibers of vastus medialis inserting, and then you can fan out laterally, and you can follow it all the way up laterally to where the most lateral fibers of vastus lateralis are inserting over here, okay? So here to here. When you come roughly midline, you're going to notice that down here, let's get a bit more depth. Get. Everyone see still? Yeah. Okay, so this down here is what? Femur. Right. So femur, patella, and then at some point through here when you're scanning, you will find the suprapatellar recess. Okay, so the suprapatellar recess is a recess that's basically going to come from this region here and it's going to extend up like this and then sometimes it runs kind of in like this uh, this C, this arc. Sometimes in patients that don't have a lot of pathology we actually need to uh, get them into more knee flexion. So let's have you... There. Now we can see it a whole, hell of a lot better. Okay. So, this right here, okay, starting from here, going up here, here, and then coming across, that's the suprapatellar recess, okay? So when you have this um, uh, image, you can identify a few things, okay? Up here, what's gonna be the very top layer? Skin. Skin. What's right underneath the skin? Sub-Q fat. Sub-Q fat. Then we have what? Quad tendon. Yeah, we have the quad tendon, okay? Now, there's two fat pads in the suprapatellar region, okay? This one here is called the suprapatellar fat pad, okay? You can remember it because it's the only fat pad that's actually touching the patella, hence why it's named suprapatellar. This one over here is called the prefemoral fat pad. So again, if you want to remember, it's technically the only one that's touching the femur because our, um, uh, our suprapatellar recess can separate the two. Now, in some instances, especially when you have some swelling, you may have a scenario, you don't in you, you may have a scenario where you can, the line that you would see down this way would go tendon, suprapatellar fat pad, recess, prefemoral fat pad than femur, okay? So that's just important to understand what you're looking at so that way when we flip this to actually go intraarticular, you have a better appreciation of what you're looking at. So this is how you start and you find access to the joint, okay? So I usually try to find, I don't like it when it's like, like here. Because you see how this doesn't really look like it's connected to here? It is. It's just the way that it's shaped. It's not looking like it. I don't like to go in this area just because I just want a clean, clean slice to look at. So, oops. so right there is probably where I would start my rotation, okay? 
Most of the time, this is going to be slightly lateral off the knee, okay? So here is midline. You see how we don't see it overly well right in here? It comes slightly off lateral. That's generally where you're going to see the supratile recess easiest, okay? Then from here, we're going to rotate our transducer 90 degrees keeping this super patella recess in view so that way we can do our injection so from here we're going to rotate it and we're going to keep that spot dark So now, this right here, see that line going across? That's the super patellar recess. 